So tonight's message is repentance. I'm sorry. And uh, I was provoked to do it because I preached on forgiveness a while ago. So I said, okay, Lord, um, how would you have me approach this? And the Lord was faithful and just. So I try not to use typical verses. Um, the most biggest one that most people use is the one where uh, Paul talks about that there's two types of repentance. There's repentance to the world and repentance unto the Lord. I think that's a good one, and you can find great messages on that. So I didn't want to beat that horse because I think other folks have beat it pretty well, better than I can beat it. So I wanted to move in a different direction, but also on repentance. So I titled it um, Repentance, I'm Sorry, but I had to put the word uh, really in there because I think that in our culture we say I'm sorry, but I don't know if we truly understand the kind of I'm sorry God's talking about. So let's pray. Father God in heaven, I thank you for the opportunity to speak to your people about the truth of your word. Um, help me, Lord, as I guide uh, them through the text. Spirit of God, uh, speak to both of us, me, the preacher, and the listener, that we might hear and see the truth of who you are, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we all get built up and edified by this. Let this truth be nourishing to our souls. Help us, Lord, in all things we do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So, again, repentance which is the easiest way to say today is I'm sorry, but I had to put a comma really after it because I think we say I'm sorry so flippantly sometimes, so quickly, and we don't really get into the root of why we're sorry. You know, we just feel bad sometimes, which is good. You know, sometimes we realize somebody's face is full of wetness, tears, and we're like, okay, I guess I should say I'm sorry. So sometimes we say I'm sorry due to provocation. Somebody pushes us into it. You know, you see what you did to him or her, and they're sitting there with a wet face, and you're like, I'm sorry. And that is nice. I think it's not bad, but I think we want to go deeper on this. So yeah, in your Bibles, please turn to the book of Psalms. Um, the Psalms are, are, are poems, sometimes they're poetry, and I think it'll be helpful for y'all if you get um, your Bible open to see this, because I think also while we do this, um, the Psalm we're going to be looking at is Psalm 34. Uh, the title of the Psalm is um, of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech saw that he drove him out and he went away. Now this is in Samuel, um, 2 Samuel, I think it is, where David, uh, when he got the showbread, he was running away from Saul, Saul's trying to kill him, and he gets to a temple, um, a synagogue, and there's a guy there named Abimelech, uh, Abimelech there who's a priest, and he gives him the showbread. He leaves him, and then he goes into a kingdom where there's a king there, and the king is not a Jewish king, but uh, he hears about David's song. When David and Saul defeated uh, Goliath, David sang a song. And one of the songs was uh, King Saul kills 1,000, David kills 10,000, right? And so not kingdom, but David kills 10,000. Of course, King Saul felt, felt kind of salty about that because how's the guy underneath me killing more than me? So David got afraid in his spirit, and David started acting crazy. Like, started, you know, drinking water and drooling and acting all, just acting like a madman. And the guy sent him away. Um, so David was able to live. That's what some people believe it's from. I'm not too sure, but I picked it because it speaks, I think, the best to what repentance means. So again, if you have a Bible reading, all of Psalm 34, it's not that many verses, but I'll be reading from my ESV ber version. Whatever version you have, you can follow along. I won't be putting it on the screen because there's too many verses. So if you don't have a Bible, just listen. Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord all at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lion suffers want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack nothing. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who de uh, de desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their, their cry. 
The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Amen. So I chose this particular psalm because hopefully you heard David's brokenness in this psalm. And before we get too deep into breaking it down, uh, how many people know the original language the psalms were written in? Hebrew, correct. So if you can, there's a stack. Uh, 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 Ali, can you grab a stack of paper there? I have like 15 copies, so there might not be enough for everybody in here. But um, share some. But uh, I want you to see the psalm in English and in Hebrew. Um, again, there's 15 copies, and it's probably like 35 of you or 30 years, so you might have to share two to a person. But the point I want you, as, as you're getting this back, is I want you to see that the psalm in Hebrew, this one, is actually an acrostic. An acrostic is when you have a certain type of, like, like kind of like um, scuba. Every letter means something or starts with something, like self-contained, underwater, breathing, breathing apparatus. It's a kind of way to remember stuff. So the point I'm saying is, is that this psalm is written using the Hebrew alphabet, and it goes from the first letter to the last letter. So the first letter of each uh, a verse begins with the Hebrew alphabet. Now to help you out, on the screen here, you'll see the, Greek al the Hebrew alphabet. Now, a, a, a bit of a lesson here. You read Hebrew from right to left, not left to right, number one. So the dark Hebrew character you see in the middle of the column, that's actually the verse number. And as you can tell up here, Again, you're reading my chart here from right to left, not left to right. I know Americans are so used to everything left to right, top. So you read right to left, top to bottom. So the first character is Alpha. The second character is Beth, Gimel, and etc. Now I'm showing you this, so, and I've highlighted on your paper already, the first, ver the first letter of the first word. Again, not the capital letter, the one I highlighted. If you can look, you see each verse begins with the first letter and so on and so forth, all the way to the bottom. So it was meant to be easy to remember, like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you guys know that in English, right? The same way a Hebrew would know the Hebrew alphabet from beginning to end, all 27 characters. So I want to show you that when this was written, we read it in English, and we, it makes sense to us, but a Hebrew not only, not only understood the words, but he saw the form, or she saw the form of it. And it was easy to remember because it was A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Right? So when you read this psalm, don't just take it as, a, as, a, as, a, as an American with our English, which is great. But understand that in its original language, it actually had a form that was easy to remember because it was literally the Hebrew alphabet. You know, from, from the, again, 27 characters, from alpha all the way down to um, tav. Now, as you can tell, that each character actually has a number value to it, too. So unlike English, A doesn't equal anything, right? It just equals A. <laughs> Whereas the first character, alpha, equals one, actually. And it gives more and more information. You can read it yourself. So the point I'm saying all this to you is that as we look at this psalm, don't just simply look at it for what it says, but also how it's written, the form. I mean, some of you took English classes where you had to write haikus and sonnets and all that, and it was structure-based. You know, you had to do a certain type of numbers, a certain letter of syllables and all that stuff. We've lost that today where we just write until we're done writing, right? But back in the day, not writing a poem also had to, had to look a certain way, had to flow a certain way. And as you can tell, this particular one has an, alpha, has an uh, alphabetic sequence to it using the, using the Hebrew alphabet. So it's a little nerdy, but I thought you'd like to at least know that because it's helpful when you read this psalm. To this, again, we, we, we read things with our American minds and our, and our Northeast accents and everything, and we bring it all to the text, not realizing that when it was written to the exact people written to, it had a certain flavor, and they got it, not just simply by the words, but how it was formed. All right. Now that we got that out the way, you can keep that review it later on. I thought it'd be cool for you to see this psalm in Hebrew, to see it's not just simply words, but it's actually a form, a style to it, which is kind of cool. Let's just focus on one verse, verse, 30, verse 5 of Psalm 34, where it says, to, look, I'm sorry, to those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. Now this, I believe, is the goal of repentance, is to look at the Lord again and to see his face. And because you see him, he restores you. 
Now, some might wonder, well, if repentance is saying I'm sorry, right, what's the thing that blocks us from being able to have fellowship with God? Sin. You can't approach God with sin. You can't see God if you're sinful. The Bible, it's, it's, the Bible is full of that. It's replete. It has it everywhere. So the, the goal of repentance is to be able to see the Lord again. And by seeing, just to be seeing him, you get restored. You get, you get built up. You get brought back into fellowship with him. And whatever's wrong in you gets right. So repentance is a big thing. Because without repentance, what does the Bible say? There's no forgiveness of sins. Right, so the open the, the the actual handle for our faith that you turn to come into Christ is repentant. You got to say something. So even the, our own faith, just the basis of it, just the, the floorboard of our faith, is built upon repentance, on us trusting in what Christ did and then saying to Him, "Forgive me for my sins. I can't meet the standard of the Father. I can't receive the Spirit because the Son took on my blame." And now I can see the Father, and I do have the Spirit. Forgive me for I've sinned. So repentance has to come from God first. Before we say, I'm sorry to anybody on the earth, you have to understand that everything you do that is sin blocks your fellowship with God. So repentance in its, in its, in its truest state, in its ultimate form, is looking back at God and saying, I'm sorry. Up front. I need to get out of the way because I think if we don't get that clear up front, we might get lost. Because I'm going to give you a lot of scripture today, so hopefully I can get through it. But I have to because I can't use enough words, I think, correctly to help you see repentance. So, three things I want you to know about repentance. Um, like everybody else on the planet, repentance is a word, but it's built upon other words. Now, the first thing that happens with repentance, I think all of us in general, this is not, this is not the only way, but it's the most common way. We start with anger. Anger is usually the beginning of why we need to repent. Something happens either we don't appreciate or something we do that somebody else doesn't appreciate. And there's some kind of tension, which is usually equals anger. Somebody's not happy. They expected X and they got Y, whatever it is. And from that anger, what do we want? Retaliation, right? You want to get even. You want to make it right. And that's always, I believe, where all of us end up is in the retaliation stage. We have statements that, that I think are sometimes amazing, but they make me scared. Why do good things happen to bad people? Or why do bad things happen to good people? And et cetera. We always think bad things happen to bad people and good things happen to good people. And you forget the fact that you're a sinner <laughs> saved by grace. So be careful, Christian, when you hear these things and you rest the wall. So-and-so was good. Why did that happen to them? And you forget the fall, you forget the flood, you forget a bunch of things that happened that brought us to this position we're in the day. We somehow jump back to the garden and skip the fact that there was a bunch of stuff that happened between the garden and now. You know, and we assume that we come into the world good. And that's why when something happens to somebody who's good, again, by human standards, we say that's terrible. So-and-so is a good person. How could that happen? And the best thing that could happen to that person is they need Jesus, period. Because anything they, that they, any goodness you have today, whatever it might be, great school, college, marriage, children, house, all that, hallelujah, that's good stuff. You're not going to see the Lord. That does not merit or give you access to the God. Only two things do, the blood and repentance. <laughs> so I want to showcase in the Bible the answer that the Bible gives always, repentance. It's always love. It's always love. Because in order for anybody to be at peace with God, Love had to get in the, in the way. Love had to interrupt your death. And the love was Jesus for us. He's the love that interrupted our death, our sin price. The love that he gives to us through his righteousness, through his peace, is what causes. He loved the Father more than he loved himself and us because he did the will of the Father. You know the story in Matthew. Father, can this come past for me? But not my will. Your will be done. I, I love you more than I love what I'm about to go through which means he loved you more than he loved himself because he gave himself up for you that he might save you. So understand that the result of repentance has to be love. It has to be love. Otherwise, it all falls apart. So now we're going to go into one of my favorite books, the book of the Gospel according to Matthew. And I think here we'll, we'll at least try to see those three things I showed you. Again, anger, retaliation, and love. So if you have a Bible, please go to the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to look at uh, chapter 5. Let me get my Bible up because I want to at least read it from my own. I went way past it, didn't I? All right. 
Matthew chapter 5, verse 25, 21 to 26, only five verses. But I think here we'll see, again, we're looking at what does repentance look like. And we've got to start in the beginning, which is always anger. So again, Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 to 26, the word of God says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, or if you have your person, says, um, uh, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be put in prison. Truly I, tell you, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So we know that, again, this was the whole concept of if somebody inflicts pain on you, or death, or something to a family member, you have the right to go and kill them deal with them and put them, we bring them to court, bring them to trial. But it says here within the church, again, this is within the church, your job is to reconcile, is to forbear, which means to deal with it. Now, some of us hear that and saying, why? Well, you heard, the, you heard Jesus' judgment on that. If you don't reconcile before you come to him, then you, your accuser, so if you're the one that did the, the sin or committed the, the, the fault, you're the one that's guilty, and you know it, we all know it. You said something you should have said, didn't say something you should have said. You did something you shouldn't have done. You did, again, you know the scenarios. Whatever it is, you were the one that had the fault. And your brother or sister has a grievance against you, and you don't go and reconcile it and ask for forgiveness. Last week's message. And then you who's been of hurt, you offer them what? Repentance. I forgive you. Why? Because God says to. He does not want his body constantly in strife. Now, we'll get to the other scenario, which is what if you do offer repentance and they don't receive it? Because I know that's always a big question next, right? Well, what if they don't receive them? I'm sorry. We'll get to that at the end. But up front, your burden, you, the person who committed the faults, is to go and reconcile. Have to. You have to. Because God says, why? This unity is not part of him. You know, and I know we use the word unity a lot today, but the under part of unity is that God himself, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, is always in unity. Always in unity. There's never a time when they don't agree. So that's the model we have as, as, as image bearers of the triune God. So hopefully that helps you with anger. Remember, the first part was just anger. Now stay in Matthew. We're going to move down a couple of verses to verse 38 through 42, just four verses again. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 42. And I'm, I'm going to just put up here now. We're going to look at retaliation. Verse 38 through 42. The Bible says, starting at verse 38 of chapter 5 of Matthew, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on, your right, on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you take your, um, and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now this is powerful because we always want, you know, blood for blood. You know, we, we, we want problems. If somebody punched you, you want to punch them back, right? <laughs> Let's be honest. It's not, I'm not trying to make this all scientific. It's basic. If somebody steals 10 bucks from you, you want 10 bucks back and some interest maybe, right? I mean, this is what we are. We have this, retaliata this retaliation in us because somebody grieved us. Somebody sinned against us. We want blood. Let's be honest. So if that's true and the Bible tells us that, that's not what we do. We take the wrong. And that kind of hurt to say it. But we take the wrong. We receive the badness. And some of you look at me like, what? And I'm like, I'm not here to make it all make sense. But again, if the goal is repentance, which is forgiveness, then we have to look past what we want, and not our will, but your will be done. And we're looking at it like, but you don't understand what they did. 
I'm like, you're right, I, and I never will probably. But you know who does, right? We, we believe God is omniscient. He knows everything. There's nothing he doesn't know. We believe God is omnipresent. He's always everywhere. He doesn't, nothing is, is hidden from him. You know, he, he's on, he, um, he has all strength, all wisdom, all sight. There's nothing. So if God knows, why do you worry? Whatever it is, and I'm saying this because I have to wrestle with this too sometimes. Just like you, things happen to me, and I've got to go in my closet for a couple of days, sometimes weeks, and have the Lord help me with it, whatever it is. Because some people just have me up the wall and back down it and up it and down it, and sometimes I never come back down. I'm, just, I'm still going up the wall. So I'm just saying to you as a fellow human being of flesh that this is not easy. I'm not trying to sell you something that I can fully get. I wrestle with this. But the truth is it says it, so we have to fight and not want retaliation, which is hard. I'm telling you, it's hard. But this is what the Bible says. Moving on to our final point. Again, we're just in Matthew walking down. It's the final one in Matthew, verses 46 through 48, chapter 5, just three verses. And again, we're getting to love now. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 46 through 48, the word of God says this. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors have to do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the only time I'll allow the word perfect to come out. But I want you to see in your Bible that the burden here isn't being perfect. The burden here, it says way at the beginning that we are to be like our Father. The Father didn't judge you or me when we were sinners. He gave us mercy. He gave us grace through Christ. And he forbear us for a long time until the Christ of Jesus came, the Messiah came, that we might know him and by knowing him be at peace with the Father. So my question to you is, if it's easy for you to forgive your family, and some of you probably it isn't, because just like me, I got family members, I'm like, wow, that's in my family line? We have the same people? Wait, wait, whose cousin, who's, who's their father again? Who's their mother so it's not just simply us saying that, you know, everybody in our family we love, but it goes further. It goes past family. It says to enemies, to people we don't like. And I think here's the, the, the bottom line of this. Sometimes we look at people and we throw labels on them that are unfair. I'm going to be blunt, terrorist, Muslim, atheist, agnostic. And all these labels are just beliefs that in the mind. That person is an image bearer. They have the respect of God because they have the image of God in them. And when we do these things, we put labels on people, rapist, murderer. I mean, you can throw the labels all you want. At the end of the day, that person is an image bearer. And it's not, again, I'm not trying to say this is easy. So don't walk away from this saying, Ron's just saying abracadabra and forget. You forgive, but I'm not saying forget because you can't. That's impossible. Just forgive. And remember, repentance, repentance is our duty as Christians. We carry that because our Lord gave it to us. That's his gift to every Christian is repentance. We have the ability to say, I'm sorry, because we truly know why we're sorry. Because we know we were forgiven much. So we can forgive. And repentance isn't far from us because the, as, as close as Christ is to you, is as close as repentance is to you. If you have a hard time getting to repentance, I don't know how Jesus is close to you. You don't know him that well. You don't visit him enough. You don't pray to him enough. You don't read his word enough. I just, you, you don't. Because repentance is literally what he brings. So for you people who are, I just can't forgive him. I, I'm scared for you because I'm wondering, do you know Jesus well enough? Because he's the author of repentance. Our faith is based on repentance, literally. So if you can't forgive, if you can't give repentance to somebody, do you know that you were, for, that you were given, that you were forgiven? That repentance came to you first. And it came to you when you didn't ask for it. You didn't want it. Actually, you hated it. You wanted blood. All of us did. We wanted revenge. Everyone does. Nobody wants to be wrong. Everybody wants to be right. And I raised my hand first. Hit me wrong. But humility teaches you better. And Jesus teaches you even more. So while you're in Matthew, go forward to the book of Corinth, 1 Corinthians. This is a picture of a drawing or rendition of Corinth. Some people believe that Corinth was like this little town. Now, it was a city with walls. It was beautiful. It was big. There was nonsense going on in that city, just like our city today. So as you turn, um, we're going to be looking at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 through 11. So 
I was just telling that this book is great because in Corinth, we had a bunch of amazing things going on. We had rich people and poor people. We had people who came from the world and people who came from idolatry. So it's a great jumping point for us to at least understand more, I believe, love, because that's always a concern for God. If the basis of your repentance isn't love, then you are asking for repentance for usually the wrong reasons. And it's not because you love the person. You love the person who made that person. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 through 11. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law, the, the court systems, before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is none amongst you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law or to, to the courthouses against brother. And that before believers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat to you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves, well, but you yourselves wrong and defraud, even your own brothers. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Amen. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Now I chose this because repentance has to do with unity, but more importantly, it has to do with wrongs. I mean, we live in a world of wrongs, and they happen all the time. Some of them, we look at them and we're like, how could you even do that, or say that, or, or be with that person, or not be with that person, or whatever it is, or support this, or not support this, or vote for him, or not vote for him, or vote for her, or not vote for her. All these things cause us to have divisions, and even worse, we hurt each other, and then we go outside of the body to fix it. And the core of the issue is there's no Christian love. And because there's no Christian love, there's no repentance. There's no forgiveness. There's no grace given. We want to hold people to every last penny. We want to choke them until their face turns blue so they can feel our pain. And the sad part about this is that this is happening in the church. We're supposed to be the witness to the world that God looks at and says, because of these people, I, I can see him. That was the job of Israel. God brought a people to himself in Israel that the world might see Israel and come to Israel and then come to him. So God is always meant for the end result of his witness to be him and his power and his glory and his majesty. And through your witness, again, his holy ones, his saints, people who don't know him will come to him and question and say, who is this? What's going on? I mean, we read about it, right, in, in, in Exodus, with, I'm sorry, in Genesis, with Joseph and his brothers and how he was so amazing and everybody wanted him, right, because whenever he went, he prospered them. And we forget that we are greater than Joseph because we have Jesus and we have the Spirit. Joseph was just used to deliver his people. We're used to deliver the world. Our witness, our life, our actual life is meant to do more than what Joseph did. But we forget that our life is supposed to reflect the mercy of God, the grace of God, the forbearance of God, the truth of God, et cetera, et cetera. But at the bottom of all that is that God has love, and his love was through his son. And because his son forgave us, we can forgive others. But more importantly, we can repent. We can ask God to forgive our sin. So how much more within the body should we do that? That's the hardest part, I think, of, 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 of repentance is it has to start in the household of God. It has to start here. We can't go out in the world and try to do all this amazing stuff and witness for God and do great works and help the poor. If even within our own assembly, our own local body, we don't have repentance. That's when it happens. It showcases that we don't have, again, when I, the purpose of repentance is the door handle to God. You repent, Jesus is the door. 
But he offers repentance. Repent and what? Believe the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand. I mean, that's the beginning of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Repent. The first thing he says is repent. <laughs> not listen to me. Not, hey, look what I just did. Turn. Call out to God. Tell him what you are and why you need him. I'm a sinner saved by grace. We all say that all the time. We sing it in our songs. But I don't know if it goes from the head to the heart. It just stays in the head. You know, we, we hear it. We love it. It sounds good. We sing these amazing songs. We raise our hands. But is it in you? Do you actually feel that? Is that something that you, that once you feel it, do you push it out? Or does it just stay in here? No, 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 no. Repentance is just for me. It's me, 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 me. And for them, he's going to hell. <laughs> She's absolutely, there's no way God is putting him, her in, in heaven. Look at her. And not realizing such was some of you, but you were washed. So again, hope that helps. But I want to go back to the Old Testament and talk about a certain king I think would be helpful. This probably will be my last example. So we're going back to see our brother, King David. We're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 11, so while I'm talking. This, I think, will help us understand what does repentance look like, though. We've been studying it, right? We know there's anger, we know there's retaliation, and we know there's love. And we know that repentance is something God gives first. We know that he is the author of repentance. But some of us struggle with what does it look like? What does it mean to actually literally repent? Because we always say, I'm sorry to, you know, situations, and, and most of us have to be called out, right? We're not convicted by the Spirit. Somebody comes up and says, well, you know when you, right? And you're like, I didn't, you're like, yeah, you, and they're like, oh, you're right, I did, and what happens? I'm sorry, right? And it's kind of more of a guilt thing, right, than it is an actual God thing. So again, we're going to look at 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses, at the end of it, let me get my Bible up real quick, verses 22, Verses 22 through 27. This is the end of chapter 11. So if you have a Bible, we'll be looking at the end of chapter 11. Um, oh, go one, one chapter. At the end of chapter 11, we see here, uh, the very interesting, yeah, the quick background before we jump into the text. David just had Uriah killed, impregnated Uriah's wife Bathsheba, and he's feeling kind of good about himself because, you know, he got away with it, right? He's a king. He tried to get him to sleep with his wife while they're... Uriah is a, is a soldier. He's a servant of, of David. He's a, he, he's a Hittite, which means he's not of the covenant, but he's still one of David's men, one of his boys. And he sends him out to, to go sleep with his wife. He, he, said, he, he, he pulls him from the war front. They were having this massive battle. He pulls him back and says, hey, why don't you go, don't go home? And he's like, my brothers are out there sleeping in tents in the field. I'm going to sleep at, the, at, at your door. And he doesn't go home to his wife. The second night he, ch- he gets him drunk, he won't, Uriah's like, he, Uriah does get drunk, but he stumbles on the floor in front of David's house and sleeps there again. And then finally, he sends David back with a message for his own, for his own death. And he says, give this to the general. And he gives it to the general, and the general reads it and says, put Uriah where the fighting is the most fiercest. And then pull back and let him get slaughtered. And that happened. So I'm giving you some background before you jump in this text to see what happened. And he did all of this because he took his wife. He knew which one he was. That was his, 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 his one, one of his men, his main men's wives. And he, he wanted her. So let's go to our text again. Second Samuel chapter 11, verses 22 to 27. The word of God says this. So the messenger, again, this is right after David sent the, this messenger back to the general and said, hey, give this message, David, take this message to David. I'm, Give this message as you go back with, 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 with Uriah and give it to the general. And the general will read it and do what I tell him to do. Verse 22. So the messenger came and told David all that Joab, Joab had sent him to tell. The message, this, is, so this already happened, and the message is coming back to tell David what happened. Obviously, Uriah is dead. The messenger, the, the messenger said to David, The men gained an advantage over us, this is the enemies, and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back. To the entrance of the gate. Then the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. David said to the messenger, Thus shall you say to Job, to Joab, Do not let this matter displease you, for the sword devours one and now another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it, and encourage him. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, had died, she lamented over her husband 
And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So again, you already know the story. You know what happened. He killed his best friend to get his best friend's wife. We have songs about stuff like this, but we don't do the murder part, right? There's a song back in the day called Jesse's Girl. Uh, Y'all probably heard about it. I wish I had Jesse's girl. You know, we always want somebody else's thing. I don't know why in America we have this infatuation with somebody else's woman. But it's, it's, it's sick, I think. I think it's, it's, it's foul. There's something wrong with that. Because you're looking at God and saying, what I have isn't enough. You're envying. You're, 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 you're lusting, too, by the way, but you're envying. So, so many commandments are being broken here. But I want to just focus you in on this one particular thing. God says clearly at the end of chapter 11, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And you remember who David is. David is a man after God's own heart. So this is a big deal. This is not like a regular person. This is like somebody very high up inside the faith who we all revere. We know that person walks with God. Not only do we know, we see it. Whenever he does something or she does something, God blesses it. So we believe this person has a very close communication, close relationship with God. So when, we, when David did this, we get to hear God's thoughts on this. Now, just go, just one chapter over, just the next chapter beginning. We're going to jump down to chapter 12. Go to chapter 12, just jump down to verse 9 through 14. There's five verses. But I think here we understand what repentance is. Now, for those of you that don't know, David gets made aware of his sin through a story by the prophet Nathan. And we jump here to verse 9 to see what happens. So at verse 9 of chapter 12, the word of God says this. Look, verse 9. Why have you displeased? This is, this is Nathan talking to, to David. Nathan's a prophet. Why have you displeased the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the son of this son. For you did it for you did it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said, Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because this deed you have utterly, because, of this, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is to be born to you shall die. So you see the outcome. And some of the people say, oh, well, you know, an eye for an eye. You killed the man, you get your son killed. And that's not what's happening here. He caused the death of his son because of his sin. But more importantly, what does David say? He didn't say, I disrespected Uriah's wife. He did, though. Uriah's family. He did, though. His soldiers. He did, though. Israel. He did, though. He did. He said clearly, I have sinned against the Lord. He rightfully places his repentance in front of God. And I think for all of us hearing this, we should understand that repentance ultimately should lead us to God and to be in front of him and beg him for repentance. Say to him what we did and say we've sinned against him. So let me give you some examples because some of this might be just like, wow, Ron, that's kind of deep. If you steal from a store, I don't care if you steal gum or you steal a toy. You're sinning against God because you're saying to God, what you provide for me isn't enough. I need more. You don't love me, God. I need that and you won't give it to me. When you lie to somebody, you're saying to God, what you've shown me, what you put in me isn't enough, and I need to tell this person more or less. I need to twist my words and trick this person's mind. All these things are assaults on God, but we say, oh, no, no, I just hurt them. I just hurt him. I just hurt that one. And no, you didn't. Your sin is always against God because the person you're sitting against is an image bearer of God. Whether they're a Christian or not, I'm going to say it again, whether they're a Christian or not. 
Your job is to always represent your God in truth, love. But if you sin against a person and you never tell God, I'm sorry for this thing I did because I didn't trust you, I didn't believe in you, something you did at the end of the day ends up on God's, foot, God's doorstep. And all of us forget that when we sin against somebody and ask for repentance and we don't go to God ultimately and say, God, this thing I did or didn't do or said or didn't say or whatever it is, and go before God himself and say, God, I've sinned against you in this thing, whether it's lust, premarital sex, lying, violence, whatever it is, you have to go to God and give him his repentance because he's the only one that can restore you. It's his job to forgive. It's his job to restore. It's, you, you read it. We just read it in Psalm 34. He's the one that restores you when you sin, when you're fallen, when you're broken, when you're in fear. And trust and believe, when you sin, you're terrified. If you lie, you're afraid to be caught. If you lust, you're afraid to be caught. If you steal, you're afraid to be caught. And even though the world might forgive you or might not, God has to forgive you. And he does through Christ. You read it again in Psalm 24, read it again. If you come to him, he will restore you. He says that. And a lot of us, don't come to him. We run and hide in our corners and we lie to ourselves and keep lying and make bigger lies. And we somehow believe through all this nonsense, God's going to be like, eh, come to heaven. You're good. He's like, but you don't, you don't love me because you didn't trust me. You thought whatever that was that I knew already, by the way. I knew that. I saw you do it. I was right there. I wasn't in the corner just because you had the lights off and you were, you know, in a dark alley or whatever you were doing and you're on your cell phone or you were, you know, your computer's turning an angle and you have to dim it all the way down or the music low and you're listening like, ooh. What, God doesn't hear that? The ears you have, he made. The, the, the music you hear, he, he caused it to happen. The recording that you are listening to or watching, he's the one that allowed that to happen. So how does he not know that? So I think we got to realize our shame is our worst enemy. It sucks, amen, I don't like it, but he knows it. So whatever I do to you or to somebody else, I have to go to God at the end of the day. I told my wife this in the beginning of our dating. I'm just, I always bring up my sermon to realize. I, there's always something about my wife. But I told her, babe, before I lie to you, I have to lie to myself. I gotta fix my mouth and fix my brain to tell myself this untruth before I fix it and push it out of my mouth into your ears and make you believe it. So if I'm lying to you, please pray for me that I get corrected myself first. And I go to my God and I, and I fix that too. Because until this is right, this will never be right. Until your horizontal is clear and clean. Again, you don't clean, he does. You talk, he cleans. You ask, he gives. That's how it works. It's not a two-way street, it's a one-way street. You just say, help, and he brings the help down. But we don't say help. We say, I got this. We say, ah, that's not a big deal. And we shove it. And by the time you look back, you have this mountain of nonsense. And mind you, he can just get rid of it just like that. But we forget. So again, David shows us repentance has to go to God. Did he make right by Uriah? We don't know. Did he make by, right? we don't know. But we do know one thing, God heard him, and God forgave him. But he had to deal with the consequences, right? We saw, there was, if you know David's life after this, his kids are crazy after this. They all, this one's raping that one, this one kills that, it was horrible. So let's not forget that the consequences to sin people, God forgives you, you will be with him, but as you walk through this, it's gonna be rough. And this segues to our final verse. First Thessalonians chapter four. You just write it down if you don't wanna, uh, I just wanna have on the screen. Um, this, I think, will help you, brother, and you, sister, as you think about repentance, because I think some of us heard all this now about David, and we say, oh, man, so I gotta suffer? Is that true? And God has an answer for that. So in the first Thessalonians chapter four, um, this part of, of chapter four, it begins with a call to holy living. And it kind of gives us a list of the, of, of the virtues and the vices of believers. So this is the end of chapter of, of the book of Thess Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. And it's telling us something I believe all of us should think about for our Christian living, how we live our life, how do we walk every day. So in chapter 4, starting at verse 3, the word of God says this in 1 Thess Thessalonians. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, so remember, the goal of this section is sanctification. And sanctification is what happens to all believers as you grow in Christ. God cleans out your sin and puts more of his righteousness in you. When you were saved, you weren't automatically sinless. As far as your judgment is concerned, you're good. 
But as far as you're living, you got to work through it <laughs> with fear and trembling. So this is the part of your faith that God commands all of us to, to work through. This is us working through it. And again, you don't earn price stripes. This isn't like you're earning God points. It's simply you're looking to live a life that's holy, that's separate, but still in the world. So again, so when you see a semicolon, a col you know, which is a, a dot with a comma at the bottom of it, that means that it's the next section. So we're going to see two things here. The first is, so man, the goal of these two sections is sanctification, having a better life in God, a more fulfilling life, a more glorious life, a more victorious life. So the goal of this section is sanctification. The first thing it says is that you abstain for sex, from sexual immorality, colon, semicolon, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness, comma, holiness and, 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 and honor, not in the passion or lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Semicolon. So we're going to another one. So that's three things so far. We want a third thing. That no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. And what am I saying? Well, I you hear this clearly. The Lord is the avenger in all things. So as you walk in your Christian life, Working and having the Spirit work through you for sanctification, making you more of a Christian, more holy. As you repent to people, if they don't receive you, or if you wrong somebody, ask for, for, for forgiveness, and they don't say, I forgive you, who ultimately has revenge? Who's, who is the avenger here? God. So for those of you who've repented, or asked for forgiveness, or offer forgiveness, and the other person won't receive it, or whatever, you've done your part. That's it. You can't control the other person, the other party. Your job is to stand clear with a, with, with a clear conscience in front of your God. So you offer repentance. Again, ultimately to God, but the people who you walk through or walk into or whatever happens, you deal with that. Remember, we read that back in First Corinthians, I mean First Corinthians, uh, Matthew. In Matthew. About taking your, your brother to court and all that stuff. So remember. Your job is to make sure that you walk in sanctification, the spirit, and that if something isn't resolved and you did the best you could and you asked for forgiveness and you gave repentance, then God takes care of the rest. That's not your job. And that's going to happen. I'm just preparing you. You will encounter situations where you did everything you could to ask for forgiveness, to give repentance, and the person's just a rock. You're just not, no, I don't care. I hate you. I'm not forgiving you. And you give them tears, you give them what you can, and you do what you can, they're just loving the person. But at the end of the day, vengeance is never yours. It's God's. And you gotta give that to God, because you can never avenge properly. All of us do the worst revenge. We're horrible revengers. So please, the only avengers I like are the ones on TV that are, that are cartoons or the movie, the avengers, that's it. Other than that, God is a true avenger, amen. So, verse seven. For God has not called us for impurity, but holiness. Remember, God has called you and me and all of us for holiness. And impurity is anything. It's strife with your brother. It's lust. It's anything you do that causes you to separate from God through sin. Whatever sin you do, that's what causes impurity. And we're called a holiness. We must seek peace. We must seek peace. Again, finally, final verse. Therefore, whoever disregards his, uh, whoever disregards this, disregards not man but God, who gives His Holy Spirit to you. And just focusing here on, on what I'm going to tell you, you don't disregard man if you don't seek your sanctification, if you don't look to be holy in the eyes of the Lord. Your repentance has to go to God. And if you don't seek to be holy, which means again, be with Jesus and access His repentance, you don't disregard that person. You disregard God. Your repentance that you give is always connected to the God that you serve, the God that you love. And if the God is the God of the Bible, then you're good. But unfortunately, all of us before Jesus are tethered, are connected, are chained to the God of this world. And he is a horrible taskmaster. He will make you work and work and work until you die. And when you get there, you say, if God did not do enough, and he goes, you weren't mine? You weren't mine? son, you are my daughter, your father was a devil. And I'm saying that to just make you understand that that's everybody's default. Nobody chooses that. You don't wake up and say, ah, today I'm going to choose Jesus. 
No, nah, tomorrow, definitely the devil. I just need to just get it out. You don't do that. We're all born connected to him. And God, by his graces, breaks our chain and connects it to him, himself. And he's the one that's now our Lord, our overseer, our captor, our savior, our shelter, our rock. I can use all these titles. But at the end of the day, that's who we answer to because that's who protects us. That's who saves us. So hopefully this makes you understand that repentance, again, what we talked before, anger, retaliation, love. If these things aren't in you, and they are, by the way, we're all of us get angry. All of us want retaliation. It's the love part that we have to work on with the Lord. And that's where repentance has to begin. Because we know he loved us. So we have to love that person. Again, I'm trying to tell you something that's hard for me. So don't look at me like I got this figured out. Please, I'm just a preacher. I'm just giving you the news. I'm just a horn. I'm just a voice. But the truth is, the scriptures tell us that we have to work hard at that and press down our will and seek his will. And it's not easy. I'm, again, I'm not telling you something that I've mastered. I'm just preaching the truth that I have read and I'm giving to you. My final slide. And it's very powerful, so just take it in. The hand that you reject in repentance is not your brothers, your neighbors, or your enemies. It's the Lord's. His hand that saved you, that dragged you out of the fire of, of, of hell, had holes in it for you. And he offers you repentance with that hand, same hand. So when you don't access repentance, you're slapping away the hand that pulled you out of the fire, that woke you up. And the holes in his wrists mean nothing. The holes in his feet mean nothing. The spear in his side mean nothing. The blood means nothing. Because you're saying to God, I don't care what you did. I can't accept your repentance, so I won't give repentance. Because he's the only one that gives it. Nobody else gives repentance. The devil doesn't give repentance. Your parents don't give repentance. God gives repentance. And his best displayed, in all, and I think the most clearest display of that is Jesus on the cross. He offered up himself that you can call to him now, whereas before you couldn't. So I'm hoping this message gives you a little push to think about your repentance and what it means to repent and offer repentance. Because it's not something that's going to be easy, I think, at most times. And saying I'm sorry and not come to God, that's a big no-no. Just, just think about that next time you say I'm sorry. Think, did I go to God, though, with this, too? Did I go to my Lord and tell him I'm sorry to him, too, for whoever I And sometimes we hurt ourselves. Don't forget that, too. You got to learn to forgive yourself because some of us don't do that enough, and I'm a victim of that. And say, God, help me forgive myself because I beat myself up more than I beat other people. My wife knows that about me a lot. And that's because I have, I have perfectionist tendencies. I'm legalistic about things, which is not good. But the Lord in his faithfulness, the Lord in his, in his grace, teach me to be just more humble and just trust him more. And and remember, legalism and, 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 and perfectionism is somehow you want to have control. It's a control issue. You don't want to give God control. You just don't. That's the bottom line. You don't trust him. And I have to fight myself with that every day. So let's pray. Father God in heaven, I thank you for the opportunity to speak to your people about the truth of repentance. Lord, I pray, I pray that they heard your words and they were pierced by them, they were encouraged by them, they were cut by them, they were built up by them, Lord. I pray, Spirit, that you give them what they need to know you better, that they can come to you now boldly to the throne of grace and just receive from you all the truth that you have. Um, let your word be just sweet to them. I mean, your, your Psalm 34 says, taste and see the Lord is good. I pray that's true for them. Help us, Lord. Keep us from ourselves. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church.